I'm not sure. The question is, how long does it take to, for the satellite to take a picture of a single view? Yeah. And I'm not entirely sure about that. But that's several satellites taken. That. Well, these are, these are all individual photographs taken at specific times, and then we strung them together in, an, in a loop. Same, same instrument taking the shot? Yes. Mm -hmm. Same instrument. It's a single satellite. It's a single satellite. No. One satellite goes east, okay? Goes. There's several GO satellites, geostationary orbiting environmental satellites, GOES, okay? NOAA, NWS, just remember acronyms and you'll be a lot happier. The GOES satellites are 22,500 miles up. There's one over the east coast, one over the west coast on the equator. I think it's on the equator. And they're looking down, taking photos of visible infrared, water vapor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Different wavelengths of energy emitted from the earth. And this is in the visible spectrum, therefore we can, it's like looking down with your eyeballs, like I said. But each picture is just an instantaneous photo and then we just string them together. That's why it's a little bit jerky. Now, you were talking about the, the heat and stuff coming from the ground and having an effect upon that. When you go over to like Atlanta or a big city where you've got to have more heat than you do out mm -hmm. in the other, does that affect the water? There's urban heat islands, yes. Atlanta has a lot of pavement and concrete and during the summertime, for instance, if you've ever been in Atlanta in July, downtown Atlanta, it's hot, you know, and it's hotter there near pavement than it is out, you know, in the country. Will that show up on the satellite? Or do you Not invisible, but it, but it can show up, yes, in infrared, in infrared imagery, it can. I'll, I'll show you some things out in just a minute, I'll show, but this is winter time, so it's a little more obvious, so it's actually a good thing. I want to show you some things about the the satellite here though, you see the clouds stop right here at the Mexican coast and they go across the Gulf of Mexico up into the southern Appalachians. So it looks like, if you just look at this, there's, there's the moisture source, right? All this is thick, heavy clouds and as you notice as the day goes on you start to see more definition in the cloud tops, see that? Because the sun's getting lower. Well it looks like we're picking up moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and bringing it up into our area. That's a good source for, a, for tropical moisture for us to rain really hard. And that appears to be what happened this week, right? Well, you're dead wrong, and I'll show you why. <laughs> uh, you're partially correct, but... But there's more, wait, there's more. Okay, now I wanna show you some other things before we come back to that. Okay, sun comes up, big cloud, formations here. You can't see very well unless you really know what to look for, but there's a few little cloud elements in here, very high, that will zip along a little faster than the rest of the clouds, and that's an indication of the jet stream. Okay? There's a better way to view it, though. I want you to look over here in this area. Well, actually, in, in the southwest. There's a bunch of clouds moving, and then there's this big white area in Colorado that's not moving at all. What's that? Yeah, the Rocky Mountains are covered in snow. They're having a good year from Denver over to around Salt Lake. I grew up here, and my mom is sick and tired of the snow, and she's coming here next week. <laughs> okay? She does this every winter. Okay. My two daughters live outside of Salt Lake, and they're sick and tired of the snow, but they can't afford to come here. <laughs> I love my kids, and if they're watching this on the Internet, I love you. Just so you know, but I didn't choose to move to the snow, okay? I got out of it, because <laughs> I grew up in it. All right, so there's, there is a big snow field in here. You can see it all the way down into the central Arizona and New Mexico border. That's pretty far south for that much snow, but they got it. I mean, it's as far south as Atlanta almost, it's just higher terrain. Now, when, a, when the sun comes up again, I want you to look out to the central valley of California. This is from roughly Fresno, Bakersfield, up to about Redding, California. None of that's moving, right? Is that snow? Elevation's 50 feet in there, and it's close to the ocean. So it's not cold. What is it? Fog. This area right in here is famous for its Interstate 5 multi-car crashes in the heavy fog. Okay? They, I mean, 100-car pileups. Are, I'm not saying you call them a regular occurrence, but when you hear about them on the news, you go, oh, it happened again out there. Because the fog can be so thick in that valley. 50 foot elevation in many places. So, so that's good for looking at fog 
as long as you know your terrain and your general climate, you can't go, oh my gosh, look at all that snow in California in the Central Valley, because that's probably not the case. And it doesn't melt as the sun comes up. All right, now there's a line here of snow, because that's the Sierra Nevadas. And they're up to, you know, 13, 14,000 feet in there, so that is snow. All right, I don't think there's anything else I want to show you on this one, but I, I do want you to watch. Oh, there is a couple things. Let me show you up here. <clears throat> you see some clouds that are oriented like this, correct? Up in, or in southeast Oregon, there are, looks like lines of clouds that are oriented from southwest to northeast. This is something I want you, this is an assignment you have from now on the rest of your life. I want you to watch when the winds are pretty strong over the ridge tops because you'll see a cloud that's kind of a line. And it looks like it's not moving, it'll be there all day. And the wind's just blowing like crazy over the mountain. That's called a lenticular cloud or it's shaped like a lens or a lentil, okay? Air goes up the mountain, cools off, condenses, makes a cloud, blows through it, that area, the cloud stays there, and then the air is stable enough that it drops back down the other side. As it comes down, it warms up again, and the cloud evaporates. The cloud is stuck right there. It's not going to move. It's anchored to the mountain, because the mountain is what's causing the air to go up. So if you took the mountain away, the cloud would go away. But the air goes up and down and makes a, like a cap cloud over that mountain. You get them up here a lot. Get them out west all the time, over the Sierras and the Rockies, because they're so high. But we still get them here quite a bit. People have to remember that just because the elevation of the mountains here is only four to 6,000 feet generally, we start way down low. Where I grew up in Denver, I grew up at 5,300 feet on the prairie. And then it goes up to 11,000 feet on the front range pretty quick. Well here, you can go from 600 feet in the valley to 6,600 feet at Klingman's Dome in the same distance. So you get the same kind of local relief that you get on the front range of Colorado. So watch for these lenticular clouds. The, the wind here is blowing this way. You can see the, the higher clouds moving from northwest to southeast, and it's moving over mountains in that region of southeast Oregon and blowing up over a ridge and down the other side and up over another one and down the other side and up over another one and down the other side. And that's where you're getting these little lines of clouds. Pilots use those because you don't want to fly into that stuff. <laughs> I lived around Mount Rainier for a while, early in my career, and you would see a trail of these lenticular clouds on satellite, well, even with your, with your naked eye, downwind for 100 miles from that thing. Because this starts from sea level and goes to over 14,000 feet in no time at all. It's a monster. And so it would form a cap cloud and then another one, another one, as the air just kind of finally evened itself out over, you know, a long ways. So those are some things you can look for that are pretty subtle on satellite that you can also see with your naked eyes on the ground. Yes, sir. So if you threw the disc frame on there, where would it be? It's hard to tell with visible. The question is, where would the jet stream be on this? Because I worked this event in the office, I was there for, I don't know, six months last week. Seem like. <clears throat> I know there's a jet stream in here because that is partially what created the lift of the moisture and the created the lift necessary to rain as hard as it did. But there's also another branch of it in this area, but it's, I can't pick it out in the visible satellite. But I'll show you some other things that maybe will help us. What is, if that didn't cause the rain coming up, the water, where did it come from? The jet stream coming down? This stuff? Yeah. What caused it? We're, we're coming to that. We're coming to where the rain came from. Because remember, I told you, here it looks like the clouds started right here and produced all that. And you agreed with me, and I made fun of you. <laughs> okay. All right. The next type of satellite imagery we're going to look at is infrared. You've heard that word before. Basically, the camera measures the temperature of what it sees. That may be the cloud tops, it may be the ground, or it may be the sea surface. It doesn't know. It can't go, oh, that's a cloud. And that's blah, blah, blah. It just looks down and records what it sees because the Earth absorbs energy and re-emits it at a different wavelength. And so all these things have different wavelengths and those correspond to different temperatures. And that's pretty useful. 